What are the signs of the times? Two kingdoms are at war. We are in a clash of dynasties. The headlines today seem to indicate that evil forces and the power of darkness are prevailing in the last days against the kingdom of light. The signs are wars and rumors of wars, natural disasters and man-made calamities. Will we be the generation to witness his coming, to witness both a great awakening and a falling away from the faith? How do we fight for the kingdom of light? How do we know how it ends? Let's look at the headlines. Well, I've been nervous all week because I have um, like a, a seri whole series worth of materials for this message tonight. I brought more stuff to this message than I, I mean like twice as much. So you're saying, well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I don't know. But I know we're going to leave here on time. But I do, we're going to paraphrase. We're going to do all kind of stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm eastbound and down, loaded up and trucking. And I'm going to have to do what they say can't be done. Okay? <laughs> you either get it or you don't, right, Martha? Right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, if I don't get into it and quit climbing around, we'll never get to it. So um, the title in this series is um, the headline series for tonight is Tribulation, Pure and Simple Tribulation. And uh, I confess that nothing can be exhaustive on a study like this. You got literally months of Sundays you'd not get done or months of weekends. But let me introduce to you a little bit of some things that will help give some guidelines for us. Uh, some principles of Bible study. One of them I say all the time. The Bible is telling one story, his story. That's what he's telling every time. However, there's three things here to just get a hold of. And if you're in life groups, and all, everybody should be, uh, there's some good exercises you're going to go through within this message about this. Number one, a great principle of Bible study, all Scripture has one primary interpretation. Not two, not three, not four, not what do you think, what do you think, what do you think. It's the story is the story. It's telling a story. It means this, all right? Uh, secondly, all Scripture has several practical applications. Thank God that any season of my life, I can go to the Word of God, hear from the Word of God, and apply something to my life in my situation. So there's plenty of practical application. There will be some tonight. And the beautiful thing is something that would hit me may not hit you, but something that's hitting you may not be hitting me. There's plenty of practical application. Thirdly, most all Scripture has a prophetic revelation. Think back up to point number one. The story is the story, but remember God's always telling his story in the story, so there's something prophetic that's happening there as well. And we're going to get a, a good look at some of those things tonight. Now, last week we looked at one event that is going to bring us to a natural division in the world, and that is the rapture of the church or the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means one door is going to open, Jesus is going to... The, the voice of the trump of God is going to call his church, those who know him, up out of this world. And then that door is going to close and another door is going to open and his wrath is going to be poured out upon, uh, this, uh, upon this world. So what we looked at last week was for those of us who left, what is next? And what is next is the judgment seat of Christ. We are not going to be standing before God in given account of our sin, all our sin was paid for on the cross. And our sins were removed as far as the east is from the west. But you and I are going to give an account of what we did with what we were given. That means our stewardship, our talents, our abilities, our gifts. The very fact that you were born in a country like this uh, and not living in a third world country under a bridge or in a slum somewhere. Listen, God expects something different out of you. And he expects something of every person, no matter where they live in the world, and that is do what, do what you're supposed to do with what you've been given. And honoring God with that. I mean, it'll be actions and attitudes. How did you raise your kids? What was your priorities of your life? I mean, those things are just unfolded for us there. So tonight, I'm going to speak on the other group. When the rapture is the natural division, one left, one stayed. And the, the people who are left behind. So it begs a question, why were they left behind? Some will just be, honestly, outright God-haters, atheists, agnostics, demonic-type people. Others will be those who had some sort of religion 
of some sort, but it was wrapped up in a lie, some cult or ism or so forth. Uh, they had relationships. Um, I'm sorry, they had religion, but they did not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Still more people will be those who had faith in something other than Jesus' gospel. Many more will be people who just simply have never heard the gospel. That is my heart wrench uh, of that. We'll talk about more of that a little later. Uh, I mean, people have just never even heard the name of Jesus in any context whatsoever. But most of them will not be demonic people. They'll not be atheists, agnostics, or religious sorts. They'll just be what I call the garden variety person on the planet that just failed to do anything about anything. Uh, just garden variety, if you will. They just simply neglected to do anything. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? God says, I, I'm providing you a salvation. I've sent Jesus to die in your place to shed his blood. And man, particularly in our part of the world, if you don't know that story, it's your own fault. But I don't know how you can live in America, in our culture, and not know the story. But yet you've neglected to do anything about it. I've been saying for a few weeks that we're living right now in what is called the church age or the day of grace. When everybody who wants to come and drink of that fountain, uh, hey, listen, the door of salvation is open. You just, you just come. And the idea here is don't neglect. Don't neglect to come. You've heard about it. So I've believed that all my life. But if you've not entered into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're neglecting to do your part of that. We're not talking about a religious system. We're talking about a relationship. It's like two people getting married, and, and one person, well, I don't want to get married. I know who they are. I like them. I, I might drop by every now and again. That's not a relationship. Marriage, marriage has obligations with it, and, there, there's, and, and there's, by the way, and love is at the center of it. I can't live without her. She can't live without me. It should be that way with the Lord Jesus. So when the rapture occurs, the door of salvation for most of the world will be closed forever. I'll come back to that uh, that thought is who can be saved during the rapture and so forth. There's some indications of who and who can't. So we'll, we'll look at that as, as we get an opportunity. So uh, another door, you know, one door opens, we're called out. Another door or window opens and tribulation is poured out upon this world. It's the, here's the Bible terms, the beginning of sorrows. When the, listen, when millions of people leave this world, it will be the beginning of sorrows here on this world. Uh, just pure tribulation. And eventually, after three and a half years, it moves to great tribulation, also known as Scripture as the day of the Lord or the day of vengeance. I put these up here because they're all Bible words meaning the same thing. Revelation describes uh, tribulation as a series of God's wrath and judgments, and they are this way. I don't have them outlined for you. I'm going to try to in two weeks just quickly outline the book of Revelation. It can be done, okay? Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, all the things that happen there. All of it circles back around to say that's the tribulation period. In this message, I want to introduce you to another Bible phrase that you would be helped to be aware of. We are also living in what is the day of grace, the church age, and here's one more term, and it's a a Bible phrase, but you need to get this. It'll help prophecy come alive for you. The day of the Gentiles. We are living in the day of the Gentiles. Let me explain that for a few minutes, and I'll set this up for you tonight. Hold those points of Bible study, those three things I gave you to start this message in, in your mind as we go through this. There are two primary books in the Bible that prophecy uh, it just sets in the middle of. Uh, they're bookends. One is Daniel. The other book is the book of Revelation. You cannot understand one of those books without the other book. They reference each other, though they're thousands of years apart in their writing, but you would not have a reference point if you did not have both of them. So you need both of them to go through what we go through. Um, you may or may not know this, but back in the Old Testament, God sent many prophets. That's the, when you look at the Old Testament, all those names are prophets that God would send to Israel 
to remind them that God will be your God. He's made a covenant with you, but now y'all are going south to the sewer, and you're going after other idols, and God's going to bring judgment. And I mean, all of those prophets are saying that. They're in the middle of judgment or they're post-judgment. That's the whole New Testament as far as the prophets are concerned. So he's warning them. Um, he said the Spirit of God's not always going to strive with man. I'm sending you a person to warn you. Do not neglect to do. Does that sound familiar? Don't neglect to do what you're supposed to do here. So the Babylonian army ends up besieging the city of Jerusalem. That's the southern tribes of Israel. That's, that's Judah and Benjamin. Uh, you know, they besiege it, finally overthrow it. The Babylonian army took the brightest and the best of the young people, took them back to Babylon... And they retrained them, reoriented them, tried to wipe out uh, all your stuff about God and all that kind of stuff. You come worship our idols. Let me, let me teach you how to stand in our court and be our advisors. So among them, of course, were people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Many of you know that story from the Bible. Uh, and it wasn't long that King Nebuchadnezzar had a very troubling dream, and he sought his advisors to come and interpret that dream for him. And this is something you'll find King Nebuchadnezzar doing quite a bit in the Bible. He'll say, I need you to do this, and if you don't do it, I'm going to tear all your limbs off and tear your house down. Real loving kind of a guy. And so he calls his sorcerers and the astrologers and everybody in, and he says, I've had this troubling dream, and you're going to interpret it for me. But here was the caveat. He wouldn't tell them what the dream was. He said, if you're all that in a bag of chips, you should know what my dreams are, right? And they said, no man can know that. And then he says, well, I'm going to have you all killed then. Daniel stands up, in, at, not in the presence of that company, but tells the, the um, he has favor with someone in the court and says, tell the king, I'll pray to my God and seek the interpretation for him. In other words, just, just calm down. And my God will help us uh, with that. Now, what I need to do here uh, tonight is I'm going to put Daniel chapter 2, verse 31 through 36. Everything, if you have the app, all the references there, I'm going to paraphrase or I will never get done, okay? So, uh, Daniel says, King, now what you saw was this image, and I'm going to read a good portion of this one, okay? This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you. Its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of gold, the chest and arms were silver, the middle and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, his feet partly of iron, partly of clay. And you looked, and then this, let me paraphrase, this stone's going to come and crush that whole thing. And then the stone is going to fill up the whole earth. And, and it's just all the, these uh, other parts of this image are going to be just like chaff. They're just going to blow away, uh, but the stone is going to fill up this whole entire mountain. Now, for time, let me just explain the interpretation because Daniel then tells him what God has said to Daniel to tell to Nebuchadnezzar. The caveat you and I have now is we stand on this side of history and can look back, and now we can put names in those places. All right? So, uh, the head of gold, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, that's you. There's no, there is no kingdom like Babylon. This was the greatest Gentile kingdom there will ever be is, is Babylon. But there's going to be another kingdom. Notice the, the, the metal becomes le less inferior here or, uh, or more inferior. Chest and arms of silver. That's, now we know that was the Medes and the Persians. They, were, they combatively came together. They ruled the world. These were world rulers. They overthrew Babylon. Medo-Persian Empire was there. Eventually, uh, Greek empire overthrew them the middle of the thighs of bronze and then you come down after the Greek empire that is to the, the legs um, and that are, are of iron Rome ruled the world with, with a fist of iron and eventually there became two divisions you know your history the east and the west so there's two legs that indicate uh, that they would be the world empire there and then we come down and let me just break it down to what's close to present day then there's going to be a mixture of iron and clay. Uh, there's this ten nation, ten toes federation that is going to be something like the UN. Now, there's 193 nations right now make the UN up. But how many nations do you think will have any strength left when millions of people leave? 
and there will be this federation that will come together of ten nations, but then there's a stone cut out of a mountain, and that's Jesus. And he's going to crush every bit of that, and what's left of the Gentile empires will be like chaff that just blows away, and his kingdom will fill up the whole world. So Daniel chapter 2, verse 47, And the king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is the God of gods. Amen to that, right? And Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar believed it. So Daniel is promoted along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And here's what all this means. God was commissioning Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in that moment the transfer of world rulership. The transfer. It's going from Israel's hands who broke the covenant and kept breaking the covenant. And so God is going to, you remember the parable that I gave you weeks and weeks ago? They're the particular treasure and now they're going to be scattered among these Gentile nations. They're going to be buried there. I'm going to, God's saying I'm taking the power from Israel and I'm giving it to the Gentile nations. And it's going to begin, Daniel 3 begins, the, Daniel 2, 3 begins the time of the Gentiles. The time of the Gentiles began then and we're still in it. God had purposed for Israel to be the world empire that the rest of the nations look to, not just nationally but spiritually. David, King David, was the representation of that, the warrior king. Uh, lots of people get a little soft in this area and think, man, you, you know, some group can't dominate another group and so forth. When David got done with his enemies, read the Bible carefully, the enemies sent him gifts. Like, here's some gifts, please stop. We will do whatever you say. We'll bow down. We'll, <laughs> we're not going to worship our gods anymore. We're gonna, we'll do whatever you tell us to do. David represented that. His, his son Solomon built the temple and spiritually was what David was nationally. It is something that the whole world could look to about worshiping Jehovah God. So God had purposed one day to send his incarnate son to his people, Israel, his covenant people, and he would be their king and through him administrate righteousness and truth and fill the whole earth. And by the way, that is exactly what he will do one day. But in his first coming... Remember, he's the stone, the little stone, but he was also the cornerstone in whom the builders rejected. So they've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and because of that, and the Israel then progresses into idolatry, uh, literally got to the place where they sacrificed their own kids to pagan gods, just crazy stuff you read about in the Old Testament. So 10 tribes... Are, are what is known as the lost tribes. They're still there in, in, in uh, bloodlines and so forth, but those nations are completely gone. The Assyrian army took them. The Babylonian army took the last two. That would be Judah and Benjamin. If you're still with me, say amen, please. Amen. So now Babylon, as the head of gold, had become the first divinely granted world power ordained by God that was of the Gentiles. Each successive image that is going to come on the scene is less as oppressive and less powerful, less powerful, less powerful, less powerful. You got down to Rome. Rome, no one overtook Rome. They just, <laughs> they just corroded from the inside and fell apart. They were made of iron. What's left is a mixture of clay and iron. Just, if you know anything about clay and iron, you can't put them together and they last long. They just won't hold I need for you to take a few minutes and understand and see something about Babylon because some of you know this, most of you probably don't. Babylon was located in Iraq. And when I just say that, you have an image of Iraq right now that is not impressive. Sand, yuck, primitive kind of people for the most part. I mean, it's just, y'all with me? 60 miles south of Baghdad was the ancient Babylon. Opulent would fall 10,000 miles short of what Babylon was. Hanging gardens were one of the wonders of the world. You think, well, what's big about a hanging garden? They were 56 linear miles 
of Hanging Gardens. Think of that. Get an idea of your own geography between here, Akron, Cleveland, 56 miles of Hanging Gardens. 50 to 80 feet in the air. The reason they're 50 and 80 feet in the air is because there was an upper and lower city. You have 300 foot walls, 56 miles of them. You have a lock and dam system to where they could flood half of it on one side for an invading army, literally like lock and dams like we would have in modern days. Open up, open up reservoirs, flood, make rivers, the, the whole thing. There was a tower they, there named, uh, called Bellus that rises hundreds of feet, hundreds of feet higher than the Eiffel Tower. And so wide was its base, there was a roadway all the way to the top, a roadway. At the top is a god of gold worth millions in its weight of, in dollars today. The walls that enclose the city, uh, as I said, 80 feet thick, 320 feet high, three chariots without any impending uh, on one another can ride. Every street in this 56 mile, uh, you know, linear miles, it's like that, only right angle turns. Traffic uh, was handled in the city the same way. Uh, I said there's an upper and lower because off the walls were bridges to tops of buildings and tops of households so you could walk on top of the wall, two houses, and that you, so you have hanging baskets of flowers, giant, enormous, ba I'm talking about big as this room, hanging in places to, to look at, opulent, opulent, opulent. The river Euphrates is running through the center of the city between marble banks, hear that? Artistic bridges span the river, ferry boats glide back and forth, arch tunnels allow pedestrians to cross in the heart of the city to the king's palaces. Three palaces are made up. Nebuchadnezzar's had three palaces. It's a little place that's eight miles square. These were not primitive people like we tend to think about. They, had, they were ancient scientists advanced in mathematics and physics they invented trigonometry they invented it hear what i'm saying they use mathematical models to track the planet jupiter develop methods of tracking time that are still used today they calculated the way the earth rotated and those calculations are still used today from this time period to see how the earth has shifted or changed in its rotation I remind you, closer to mine and yours lifetime, most of our idiotic world thought the world was flat. So here we are with all that. However, they continued to practice every imaginable sin known to man. They worship countless idols, and it just it's a wicked place. Babylon, when you say Babylon... There's ancient Babylon, but it's also the name that is ascribed and given to this world system. All the world system is simply called Babylon. And Christ himself is at war with the spirit of Babylon because Babylon is simply this. It is a system of self-reliance, wealth, pride, cruelty, godlessness. In other words, it is Satan's spiritual Stronghold, And when you start reading in the book of, of Revelation, you literally read about the whore, literally the whore of Babylon. All those different things are said about that. Understand there is a war with what's spiritual that had its origins in this ancient city. So ancient Babylon would eventually be overtaken by another empire as God judged them for their sins. So even though God gave them the world empire, he still judged them for their cruelty and still judge them for their godlessness. But the practice of world dominance, power, greed, self-reliance would just continue down through the ages, each empire a little weaker in succession, a little weaker but equally as wicked. And so we're at the end of those times, right at the ankles, if you want to say it that way, and there's a ten-nation federation that is, is left. But don't forget about the little stone that's cut out of the mountain without hands it's going to break that image totally in pieces and the world empires will be just like chaff in the wind so there is about 20 years between Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 3 
But remember my points, particularly of Bible study and of prophecy right here. There's a primary meaning. When you read that story, the story is the story. There's application for you right now in your life that you can take. But God's telling his story, and there's prophetic things are there as well. So let me take a few minutes and reference Daniel 3. In other words, I'm going to tell the story. We'll put the scriptures up, go right through it. Most of you heard it, know it, learned it in Sunday school. Some of it's brand new information. Wherever you are, just understand as that chapter starts out, Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed with himself, he'd thought about that image and that dream for 20 years and said, I got a great idea. I'm going to build a big giant statue of that. And I'm going to make everybody bow down and worship it because I'm the head of gold. And then, if you follow down through the verses, verses 4 through 6, he proclaimed, now we're going to play some music, and when you hear the music on the appointed day, you will fall down and worship, and if you do not, you'll immediately be cast into the fiery furnace. Verse 8, therefore at that time certain Chaldeans, that's another word for Babylonians, they maliciously accused the Jews who always had their own God. They were worshiping, right? The one and only God. And then they singled out in verse 12 and 13, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And man, they just pointed them out and went and told the king. They tattletailed on them. And then verses 15 through 18, there basically is Nebuchadnezzar bringing them in and going, boys, I like you, but you better bow out of that image or you're going to go in the fiery furnace. And they answered in so many words, king, you may do that. Our God can deliver us, but if not, we're not going to bow down anyway. Here's a great place to get an application for in your life. You need some in if nots in your life. You need to make up your mind what you stand for, what you bow to. And it's a, I know God can do anything, but if not, I'm still not bowing down to this world and the image and all that kind of stuff. Amen. Wonderful application there. So true faith that stands in a fallen world confesses the Lord and obeys him regardless of the consequences or the outcome. I know God's able, but if he don't want to or he doesn't, it's not his will, then I'm still not doing it. The, you know the story. The fire is heated up seven times the normal heat. Those who went to take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they're Babylonian names, by the way. The, the, the furnace was so hot, it burned alive the people who were taking them up and, and as they are thrown in. And then they looked down into the furnace, however that was set, where they could see. I don't know how it was. But did Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, didn't we throw three in there? There's one more in there, and he looks like the Son of God. Get them guys out of there. We got to find out about them. And they brought the three out. They're, the only thing that fell off of them was the ropes that bound them, all that burnt up. They don't even smell like smoke. Well, the Nebuchadnezzar's like, well, there's no God like your God. I'll make a decree, anybody that worships any God besides the God of heaven that these guys worship... Remember his, what he always does? We're going to tear their limbs off of them and burn their house down. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, did become a believer. I think when you read through the rest of the stories there, you, you get that. So, so he makes that decree. So again, in the story is God's story. There's a primary story. The story, it happened. What you read, that story happened. There's practical applications that you can get out of that story when you read it carefully. There's something for your life but then there's something in prophecy. And that's what I have to deal with a few more minutes tonight. The primary prophecy in this story is that Israel as a nation will be in the furnace through all the times of the Gentiles. They will be in the furnace through all the times of the Gentiles, literally millennia. Yet the promise of God is that they will not be consumed in the times of the Gentiles. It began when Israel was taken captive in Babylon and it will remain until Jesus comes at the end of the tribulation period and crushes the world empires. Amen. One incredible piece of history is that through the ages, every world-dominating factor that was there had in their plans something about extinguishing the Jewish people. Isn't that an amazing thought? Every Gentile nation through the millennia have had that in their plans. Think, think of Egypt. Remember now, listen, these, these Jews are getting out of hand. We're going to take all the boys and throw them in the Nile. Let the, alligator, let the, let the crocodiles have them. We, we can't have this. Assyria with its vicious teeth of persecution, 
Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, you, you, just things we just read a moment ago. In Daniel 5, we would read about the next empire, that's Darius the Mede who came in, uh, persecuted the Jews another time. Later it would be Greece, Rome. My goodness, I think I told you here a while back, at 70 AD, Rome, Rome went in Jerusalem, knocked the whole thing down, crucified so many Jewish people, they ran out of trees. In more recent history, it, we would know it as Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin. All of them had a hatred of the Jews. Hitler literally used fiery furnaces to burn the bodies of Jewish people. Think of that. The Third Reich is on the ash heap. It's supposed to last a thousand years. I think it made six years, seven years, something like that. But the Jews are still with us. Amen. There is a picture of Israel in all this. They're seemingly always put in the fire, and yet they're never burned completely up. It's, this is prophetic, 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 because that's the tribulation time. Why care about Israel? I got a two-minute video from, uh, I call a new friend, a friend the last two or three years, Arez Saref with One for Israel. I want you to see it because you see headlines in it, and you see Jewish people coming to faith. Two minutes, we'll be right back to the message. Let's watch it. Why should you care about a tiny state in the Middle East? This state was the birthplace of our faith, the place where the Holy Scriptures were written, preserved, and from here, spread to the ends of the earth. Our faith today is tied with this people in this tiny nation. God's promises made throughout the generations and those yet to be fulfilled. Israel, the place where the nations rage, the focus of the ire of media reporting worldwide, while also being the center of amazing innovations outpacing every other nation in the world. This tiny nation is not like the rest because God isn't finished yet. Madmen throughout the ages have tried to extinguish this light, but God made a way, and the fulfillment of ancient prophecy has come to pass in our days, before our very eyes. Israel, a sign of God's covenant promises fueled by grace for the glory of his name. But beyond the wars and miraculous rebirth, the story isn't done yet. The heartache cry of Paul in his letter to the Romans is bursting forth for Israel's spiritual rebirth. We're seeing an awakening in Israel that hasn't been seen since the time of the apostles. Millions are hearing the gospel in Hebrew and Arabic, Jewish and Arab pastors working as one, and leaders being equipped and working together for our Messiah. God is making a way for his church to rise in Israel, and you have a part to play. So why care about this tiny nation? Because you could be a part in bringing the gospel back to the root from which it came. And this awakening won't stop here in Israel, but that resurrection life will bless the church around the globe. So take your stand, join us in this historic work, and become one for Israel. So, so in our lifetime, we've seen, literally, our lifetime, we've seen Israel rebirthed as a nation, now we're seeing the spiritual rebirth from people like my friends. I, I'm telling you, Arez and those guys are, they're giving reports. There are tens of thousands of Jewish people coming to faith in Christ. And so where are we at? If you take that image that Daniel was given by God in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we're coming right to the, to the bottom there. So we're at the feet of this now 10-nation federation. Here's the idea. Rapture comes, ten nations are formed, come together, and the Antichrist steps up to lead. So, who's the Antichrist? A human being that is so given over to Satan that Satan's going to fill him with himself. Understand that Satan is always, he is right now a counterfeiter. Everything he does is counterfeit. Whatever you see God doing, he's going to counterfeit in doing. And so, God's Spirit filled the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the same idea of this human being that is going to be filled with the Spirit of Satan. So, just as Jesus Christ is the promised offspring of the woman, the Antichrist is the promised offspring of the serpent. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Here's what it looks like in prophecy in the coming days. Satan, the Antichrist, and a false prophet. The Antichrist is given about 20 names in Scripture. Some of them are simply the beast, son of perdition, man of sin, the lawless one, the little horn. That's what, how Daniel refers to him in other images and dreams. Uh, there's been much speculation about the nationality of the Antichrist. I'm going to give you references. Yeah, I can't get to them, but just to say it. Revelation 13, 1 indicates that John saw the beast coming out of the sea, meaning the sea of humanity and the people around the Mediterranean. So from this we gather he will be a Gentile. Daniel 8, verses 8 and 9 suggest that he's the, he's the small horn that came from four Grecian horns, so it means he's going to be part Greek. Daniel 9, 26 refers to him as a prince or ruler of the people that will come, meaning that he will be of royal lineage to those that destroyed Jerusalem and those were Romans. All right? Then what makes it super interesting, therefore he'll be predominantly Roman, but Daniel 11, verse 36, 37 tells us that he regards not the God of his fathers, which means he's also part Jewish. Wow. So what does that mean, Pastor? It means the Antichrist will be a mix of all the world powers. In all probability, the Antichrist will appear to be Gentile. And just like Adolf Hitler, you may not know this. Some of you didn't get all the way through history, okay? Adolf Hitler was partly Jew, but denied it. Denied it. In the same way, this person will be partly Jewish, but he's going to go after the Jews. I'll explain that in a second. Track with me for a moment. The rapture has happened. Jesus has returned. Remember the headlines we talked about some weeks ago. Millions missing. The world financial markets have all crashed. Chaos in the streets like we, chaos worldwide in the streets like we've never known. So here's the deceit of the Antichrist. I think we have it up on the other slide there for you to look. In the very early days, the Antichrist is going to be given the world powers along with the world's assets and he'll bring some stability in the world a world that's in chaos and needs somebody to speak some wisdom in it he's going to stabilize the markets he's going to give some answers lies but some answers and he'll temporarily get the world back on track okay, again can you imagine the chaos and yet somebody stands up and says hey I got this just do what I say Revelation chapter 6 verse 2 symbolically talks about that time and I looked and behold a white horse and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him that's authority and he came out conquering and to conquer but he doesn't have to fight anything because they're just he's on a white horse he's a person of peace but they crown him and just give him everything a new federation of nations are formed and he'll head it that's the feet the toes the iron and the clay mixed together Think of how weak nations like the United States will be with millions of our citizens immediately missing. And think of the assets we leave behind, our property, our cars, our bank accounts. We're just gone. We're just gone. People, what are we going to do? And here's someone who comes and seizes everything and gets the world back on track and, and stabilizes all those sorts of things. The kings, the world leaders, give their power to the beast. This means not just their military power, but also their economic power. However, this word just gets more interesting. Israel, as you know, they have a whole history of not bowing down to anybody. So the whole world in this Gentile system, we're, hey, we're going to follow this guy. He's, he's all that. But Israel over here won't. And you see immediately why they're immediately hated by the whole world. They're the holdout, if you will. So there's going to be a division there, and that's going to bring a hatred to them once again. Revelation 13, I saw a beast, verse 1, I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns, seven heads, ten diadems and horns, blasphemous names on his head. Let me paraphrase, get you down to verse 3. You see that the, this is speaking about the Antichrist who's going to, have a wound and it's a mortal wound mean you die of mortal wounds all right hold that thought for a second 
I, I, again, for time's sake, I can't get to all of it. The next section of chap, uh, verses in that same chapter talk about a, a, a second beast, which is a false prophet. Remember, he's a counterfeit. Satan is God the Father is like Satan. Here's Jesus, the Son, is the, now the Antichrist, the Holy Spirit that points people to what? Jesus. Now we got a false prophet in the world pointing people to the Antichrist. Somebody going around in the world going, this guy's got the answer. There's already in this world what I want to call the spirit of the Antichrist at work. And unless you live in a hole, you have to see this. The spirit of the Antichrist is, is already here. There is no attack on Islam. There's no attack on being a Hindu or a Buddhist. There's a full-on attack on Christians, the church, and the Bible. You ever wonder? Do you understand? Because we get caught up in gender wars and all that kind of stuff. You realize Islam holds that same stuff, but nobody talking to them about it. Satan hates the work of God, the Word of God, and the people of God. And there will always be an attack that way. There's a spirit of an antichrist that is here. There's also language right now about a one world economy, one world currency, one world citizens, and being a citizen of the world. All of this in its root is Satan trying to move the world to a place of a spiritual Babylon. With a dependence, watch now, remember the definition, on self-reliance, wealth, power, cruelty, and not God. This will not be hard to do when the whole world goes up in chaos after the rapture. The Spirit of God in us will be lifted out of this world and Satan will have free reign. Now, quickly, according to Daniel 9, 27, the Antichrist is going to make a covenant with Israel at the start of the tribulation time. A seven, interesting, the tribulation time is seven years. He makes a seven-year covenant. Halfway, three and a half years into it, he breaks the covenant. And that's what starts great tribulation for the last three and a half years, great tribulation. And that's when Israel goes back in the furnace. Now, Revelation 17, 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Let me just plainly say what that is. I said he was mortally wounded. The Antichrist is going to be killed in the middle of this tribulation period, three and a half years in, and he's going to raise himself from the dead. Does that sound like something else? <laughs> Remember, he counterfeits everything. And when the world sees him come back from the dead, that is his opportunity to seize what he's always wanted, and that is for you to worship him. The terminology for this is simply this. He enters Jerusalem, and the temple will be rebuilt. I, I don't know how quick what they're doing but I know this all those plans are there now and all the tools that implement for the temple sacrifices are they've been ready to go for years they just need the site he goes into the temple and proclaims himself God and why not right he's come back from the dead that term is called the abomination of desolation Daniel 9, 27 is the reference. Jesus himself references it in Matthew 24. We've been talking a lot about Matthew 24 in our study. Verses 15 through 22. So when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand this. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Here's what the rest of it is. You better get out of town. Remember, he's talking to Jewish men who've asked Jewish questions in Matthew 24. And he's looking ahead to this time. Listen, you better hope you're not pregnant. He says that. You better hope it's not on the Sabbath. See, a Jew can only walk so many feet on the Sabbath. He has to stop or he's breaking Sabbath. You better hope it's not in winter. But you better flee for your life when you see him because you're going in the furnace. Second Thessalonians, let me take a moment to read this. Paul writing to this church, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, I'll read and then paraphrase. At, see, at first the theme 
of the Antichrist will be exactly what being a Satanist is right now. Do whatever you want to do. Lots of people worship the devil, don't even know it, because they just do whatever they want to do. So he comes on the scene and says, hey, you be you. You do what you want to do. You have your own religion, do whatever. Three and a half years in, he says, I'm God, worship me or else. Take my mark or else. You won't be able to buy or sell without that mark saying you're a follower of his. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be too quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, in other words, somebody counterfeiting something, as to the effect that the day of the Lord, remember that's the tribulation. Let no one deceive you in any way, for the day will uh, not come unless the rebellion comes first. The man of lawlessness, that's the Antichrist, he's revealed the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple proclaiming himself to be God. That's the abomination of desolation. Do you remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The spirit of the Antichrist was at work 2,000 years ago. It's at work greater now. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. The Holy Spirit in me and you restrains it. Amen. When you and I leave, there's no restraint. And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his own mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one or the Antichrist is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all the wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so they may believe what is false. This is the reason I think your next-door neighbors and people living here in the West, they're not going to believe that you left and the rapture of the church happened because the Antichrist is going to give them a lie and it'll be so strong and so deluded that they'll believe it. And they will not be saved. So who will be saved? People who've never heard, mostly Jewish people who right now there's a tremendous gospel movement that you just saw there the the scriptures tell multitudes are them are going to come uh, to know the lord jesus christ so in the midst of all the antichrist is doing god is still reaching out to his covenant people revelation means literally the revealing of jesus christ as to who he is it's mainly for israel he's going to reveal he's going to pour out his wrath and show but look who I am. You're in the furnace, but he said, but I'm going to get, Jesus is saying, but I'm going to get in with you again. Do you see it? I'm going to get in with you again, and I'll be your deliverer, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Jesus is going to get in the furnace. Daniel 3 marks the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Revelation 13 basically marks the end of the time of the Gentiles. During all, the revela all of this, Revelation 11 Revelation 6 and 7, I'll try to reference this later because I'm, I've just burned the time tonight. You, this great, great tribulation is this. Stars are falling like a man shaking a fig tree. The sky vanishes away at one point. Earthquakes so violent, so severe, and the book of Revelation says kings and poor people went into caves and begged the, the rocks to fall on them, to hide them from the face of the Lamb. In other words, the face of the Lord Jesus Christ looking on all of it. It also tells us about two witnesses that preach and are given powers like apostolic powers for 1260 days 144,000 Jewish people 12,000 ironically from each tribe that are going to be converts I mean just preaching the gospel all over the world. Multitudes die who refuse to worship the beast and take the mark those are the people that will come to it by faith but they'll be martyred for their faith Revelation 7 and 11 just in reference point give all of those things I'm talking about brings us to Armageddon last thing I'm done the Antichrist gathers the world's armies to come against Jerusalem why because they're the holdout right this is the only place that will, they won't worship me Revelation 16 13 
if, if you read down through verse 16, he gathers the kings, the armies of the world to come, and it's all outside the Valley of Megiddo. And if you ever see that Valley of Megiddo, you realize the world's armies could fit there. They're all on horses. I used to wonder why. At price of gas, amen? <laughs> it's easier to see it today than ever. Um, all seriousness, I think there's some things to be said for that. Revelation 19, verse 11 through 21, then I saw heaven open. Let's just call it this way. This is the third coming <laughs> of Jesus. Doors open. One sitting on it is called faithful and true. We know him. And his righteousness he judges and makes war. Who's he making war with, by the way? All those who've gathered outside Jerusalem. They're, they're about to put Israel in the furnace. He's coming, get in the furnace with them. In fact, his eyes are like a flame of fire. His head are of many diadems, and his name is written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, watch now, that's me and you, arrayed in fine linen because we've been washed white and pure. We're following him on white horses. You may say, I don't ride horses. Well, on that day, we'll figure it out. <laughs> From his mouth comes a sharp sword which will strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the wine presses of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he is a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for a great supper of God. In other words, come, you can eat the bodies that are going to be laid out there. It's unbelievable stuff that you read there. Verse 20, And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet... And in his presence had done the signs of which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came out of the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. And just so you know, I haven't begun to scratch the surface of what tribulation will be upon this earth and what awaits the horrors that await this world without, without Christ and you and I in it. They've rejected him. The stone that has come to crush the world empire is now going to fill the world. I'll just say it this way. Just show me the door. Amen. There was a great uh, song by the prophets, uh, uh, Leonard Skinner. It was about a guy. It all happened at this place called the Jug. And a guy was down there, but the other guy was jealous, and it was his girlfriend and all that. And it kind of went like, hey, fat fellow with the hair colored yellow. That's my woman, you know. And the water fell on the floor, and you're looking down the 44, and the great wording is just give me three steps, right? And you'll never see me no more. In all seriousness, this is your three steps. This is your three steps. And if you don't take it, whew, sounds like tribulation is about to happen outside right now. <laughs> what fury and wrath that awaits for this world. I read through this, and there's another part in Daniel where he sees how the world is going to be, and he was sick. Studying for this message, it kind of made me that way one day, where you just have to kind of come up out of that well and go, man, this is just unbelievable to think about. The horror of people who don't know Christ. It ought to motivate me and you. And listen, I want to motivate you to go out there and speak and do all you can to get people to come to faith. And if you're here tonight and you don't know Christ, this is your three steps. This is your three steps. Let's close our eyes just for a moment. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word, how it's true. Lord, everything you said thousands of years ago to Babylon has come to pass right to this present hour. Every indication would be it's 
the rest of it's coming to pass. Lord, open our hearts and open our minds to truth. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here tonight, you know Christ as Savior. You know where you were when your sins were brought before you, but God loved you, convicted of your sins, and you put your faith in him. If you know that, you know if you were to die tonight or, or the rapture happened tonight, that he's coming for you. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, that's me. I know it. I know it. And God bless you. You may put your hands down. That's, that's most of us, but probably not all of us. If you're here tonight and you couldn't raise your hand to the certainty of that, and I know you can sit through a service like this and say, man, he's just trying to scare us. <laughs> I believe this with all my heart that the things that we just have talked about are going to happen on this earth. And I'm frightened out of my mind for you if you don't know him as Savior. But right where you sit tonight, you can know him as Savior. If he's speaking to your heart and you sense that you're undone and he wants to be in relationship with you, to believe that he loves you and to know that he died for you and gave his life for you. He don't want to be rejected by you. He wants you to receive him. He says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Calling on him is you putting your faith in him and what you believe, believing that he loved you, believing that he died for you, and believing that you want to be with him and know that you're saved and not left behind in this chaos. Begin to pray right out of your heart asking him to do that. If you need help wording a prayer like that, let me offer this to you. You could pray this prayer right behind me. A prayer that simply says, Dear God, I do believe that you love me. And I confess that I am a sinner. And the very best I know how, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. To forgive me. To be my Savior. I'm asking it by faith. And I'm asking it in Jesus' name. 